All right. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Hawley, and I'm a research fellow here with the Institute for Faith and Freedom. Dr. Peter Frank serves as provost and professor of economics at Grove City College. His current research focuses on entrepreneurship and economic development, tax and social policy, and comparative political economy. Additionally, he has served for many years as a free enterprise fellow at the Jesse Helms Center in North Carolina. Here he publishes economic policy research frequently. Dr. Frank was awarded a Fulbright Scholarship in 2012 at the Academy of Economic Studies in Chisinau, Moldova, where his teaching and research focused on microlending and economic development in a transitional economy. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Peter Frank. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hope you're having a good day. Um, so what I wanted to talk about today, you know from my, uh, the, the title put forth, uh, is the economic and cultural impact of family breakdown. And um, so, so this, will, this talk will have a lot to do with, broadly speaking, social policy and how it impacts the family, and then also implications from uh, Roe v. Wade, but then uh, some implications in the post-Roe world that we're in. And so in examining the, the economic and cultural impact of family breakdown, I want to begin by discussing the role of marriage and family as a cultural institution. Um, and then look how, at um, the, the, the clear um, or, and obvious uh, implication that marriage and family play a crucial role in the development in, of society. And intact families and more like, are more likely to th thrive um, you know, both economically and as contributors to culture when they are intact, right? When families don't suffer a breakdown. And it's clear that the changing legal and policy um, framework that exists in this country profoundly affect marriage and family. And so I want to show, as I mentioned, in this post-row environment, um, where I think legislatures need to focus um, not only in terms of, you know, what are the implications from that, that now states are going to be doing a lot of um, kind of policy making in light of post-row, but where they should focus not just in terms of abortion policy, but also family policy. So let me focus on a few uh, premises or, or points here. The first is that traditional marriage and family is a necessary component of a free and prosperous society. Uh, the second is that the benefits of society, or excuse me, it benefits society if government creates the right incentives for marriage and family to prosper. And changing legal and social framework has profoundly unintended consequences when it comes to family breakdown. And then finally, we'll uh, briefly just mention a few of the um, negative economic and cultural consequences that have resulted. Um, so the family, beginning with um, you know, some things that I think will probably be well um, uh, attuned and, and in line with most folks in this room. Um, we have a, a pretty clear understanding that the family is a crucial entity in the creation and building of culture and social capital in, in this country and, and globally anywhere. Um, in her groundbreaking book, Love and Economics, Jennifer Morse argues that the family is the foundational unit of society. Quote, a free, a free society requires self-restraining, self-monitoring, and self-governing adults, but we're not born as adults, right? Uh, the family is essential to raising individuals who exhibit trust, cooperation, self-restraint, and qualities which American society is built upon, and that family indic um, inculcates these um, qualities in children. And Morse argues that couples, um, two-parent families, are better suited to raising children um, and better than other, you know, arrangements parental remainderments, and certainly single parent families as well. And this understanding of families as the foundational unit of uh, a society whereby social capital is built is not a modern idea. The preeminence of marriage and family can be traced back to Aristotle and even before. 
The family is the basis of the political order, and the state should be concerned with this first unit of social order. For Aristotle, family possesses features of governing and highlights the relational nature of our existence. While the familiar, familiar structure of father as um, ruling and child and wife being ruled is both anachronistic and not often the reality of what we see in modern family, but uh, like a family, um, politics obviously arranges itself in such a way as to practice both those who are ruling and those being ruled. In Aristotle's most preferred government, what he calls polity, best accomplishes this idea of ruling and being ruled by allowing citizens to take part in the dynamics of both. So like a family, politics must arrange itself in such a way as to promote both the well-being of its people and denote a clear understanding of how decisions are made in that hierarchy. So jumping forward, uh, um, several uh, centuries, um, Rousseau offers a similar Aristotelian argument in the second chapter of the social contract where he argues that the most ancient of all societies and the most crucial and natural unit is the family. The family then may be called the first model of political societies. That's uh, from the social contract of Rousseau. So throughout Western civilization, the traditional family was believed to be a fundamental unit responsible for establishing societal cohesion and order. And this relational structure was fundamental to the nature of man. The intervening uh, millennia did not change the essence of this relationship and its importance for civilization to flourish. Additionally, sociologists and political theorists have long written about the family unit as foundational group whereby social capital is developed. And social capital is created by the ties within a family structure. And the cohesion there establishes the virtues of trust and reciprocity that are central to a well-functioning society. The sociologist James Coleman famously demonstrated the crucial role of two parent families in establishing this social trust and unity that leads to childhood educational success and then minimizes the dependency of individuals on the state later in life. Robert Putnam later noted that the decline in civic engagement and political participation in America coincided with the loss of two parent families. And also in his work on trust and communities, Francis Fukuyama has noted the loss of moral community and increased poverty rates because of family breakdown. So that's kind of setting the stage, and, and most of that I think we, we can appreciate. I want to um, focus next on the benefits to society if our policy structure within the governmental framework has the right incentives to provide for coherent, cohesive family and marriage, a cohesive marriage and family structure, and that changing legal and social policy has profound unintended consequences. So as the family is, as I argue, this foundational unit in society, it is necessary uh, to the flourishing of society that marriage be protected. Of course, we know that not, not all marriages last, and without a doubt, the family structure is changing in the United States. But what matters is how the United States and our policymakers choose to approach these changes. So how does the social and legal policy catalyze changes and have these negative unintended consequences is the question. Um, the government could take the position, as, as some um, sociologists and others have argued, that such changes are inevitable, and so we should just kind of uh, deal with policy in a, in a uh, post hoc fashion. Yet the economic, moral, and social consequences of family breakdown are profound and significant. And specific policies that shed light on the broad impact of family breakdown um, and other policies um, are, are uh, you know, common to us all. Policies such as divorce policy, same-sex marriage policy, and obviously the legalization of abortion. 
these policies have often made it easier to say divorce, for example, and thus catalyzing family breakdown. And this has resulted in major economic costs and also has broader cultural implications as well. An analysis of the wide, widespread impact of, um, of divorce law as one example and other social policies, it's useful to look at these examples as consequences um, of major social policy shifts. So the, the, uh, the economist Friedrich Hayek um, has famously written about the limitations of individuals or even groups to have the right knowledge, the knowledge of what he called the circumstances of time and place, to make informed um, decisions about, in, in his primary example, resource allocation. So as you know, uh, Hayek was a, uh, and many of you know, Hayek was a, a free market economist who talked about in a market system how information is dispersed among millions of individuals. And that's communicated through a free and unregulated price system. And this information is a pot impossible to attain by any one individual or group. It's knowledge that's, you know, you, you can't simply gather or pull out of a computer program. Hayek notes that, <clears throat> excuse me, that if, if um, we had the information to direct all the relevant um, information of changing and resource uh, levels of scarcity, et cetera, we wouldn't um, have this, this problem of how to understand where resources should be allocated. We would just kind of make those decisions and move on. But it's impossible to note. Well, based on you know, Hayek's um, understanding of the use of knowledge in society, that was his famous essay that he wrote in 1945, um, the author Jonathan Rauch points out that Hayek in similar fashion wrote about society's cultural change and cultural information and institutions that embody cultural knowledge. And that information, that knowledge is, is much more than any individual can master as well. Customs and norms that are passed down and survive due to a particular logic cannot be removed or simply impacted quickly through public policy change without profound unintended consequences. Social and public policy more generally is often viewed um, by many in legislators as simply a pragmatic approach to making decisions that would impact social outcomes based on feelings, based on perceived understanding of justice or how one small group perceives what's best for the whole society. And we know here that the uh, American progressive movement is littered with policy decisions based on trust and reason irrespective of any previous decisions or maybe cultural norms or uh, institutions. Social policy is often myopic and viewed as enlightened or just. Hayek would later write that we, quote, flatter ourselves undeservedly if we represent human civilization as entirely the product of conscious reason or as the product of human design. Or when we assume that it is necessarily in our power deliberately to recreate or maintain what we have built without knowing what we are doing. Through our civilization, though our civilization is the result of a cumulative uh, or accumulation of individual knowledge, man and society is constantly able to profit from a body of knowledge that neither he nor any other man can completely possess. And so Hayek makes this argument as we understand the role of markets and prices and information also exists in cultural institutions as well and cultural knowledge and norms that help govern our society. Individuals or narrow special interest groups who seek to reconstruct the social order do not have the aggregate knowledge to do so and the consequences can be uh, far reaching when and if they try. Hayek continues in his uh, famous work, The Counter-Revolution of Science, by arguing convincingly that the knowledge problem in the policy realm, as in the market system, severely challenges the role of collective decision making. He says, quote, it may indeed prove to be far the most difficult and not the least important task for human reason rationally to comprehend its own limitations. It's a great uh, line to read to young, eager students at times. Um, 
the rationalist who reason is not sufficient to teach him those limitations of the powers of conscious reason and who despises uh, all the institutions and customs which have not been consciously designed would thus become the destroyer of civilization built upon them. This may well prove a hurdle which man will repeatedly reach only to be thrown back into barbarism. So kind of that idea of the hubris of implementing policy based on special interests, based on individual desires, what's perceived by some as the f that would benefit the whole. But those, uh, the information needed to make those decisions is unknown by individuals or groups. So, so Hayek, you know, understanding Hayek, the, the ramifications of certain social policies that affect the result of family breakdown um, are a stark example of these limitations in our reasoning and, and rationality that we have. And social policy change is not just an issue of fairness or justice, right? Um, divorce law, for example, initially seen as a policy that would help protect women stuck in difficult or abusive marriages, has resulted in a culture of inequality and child poverty that could not have all, at all been anticipated. So in the case, again, in this example of divorce law, no one suggested that certain policies would lead to higher divorce rates or an increase of out-of-wedlock childbearing or child poverty or increased rates of abortion. None of that could have been anticipated or at least was anticipated at the time. I, I shouldn't say it couldn't have been. Some folks were, were certainly writing about that. They just didn't have the ear of, of many. Um, the cultural implications um, are noted by Barbara Whitehead, who, who, uh, who speaks of this um, in her research. She says, quote, when the divorce revolution began, no one could have predicted where it would lead, how it would change the shape of the content of family relationships. Years later, we have acquired a substantial body of social learning experience and empirical evidence on the impact of divorce law on men and women and children and on larger society. And this body of evidence tells us that the cultural case for divorce has been based on misleading claims, false promises, and bankrupt ideas. So broad policy changes has significant consequences. In, in um, another extensive research project by economist Justin Wolfers, he found that um, specific uh, divorce laws um, uh, change individual behavior, um, which is, you know, again, not what folks anticipated. The intention, the design was to allow people who maybe needed an out, but instead, the profound impact on even the decision to move into a relationship, whether that is wise or unwise, is impacted by the policy outcome on the back end. In addition to the divorce policy, a thorough review of recent empirical research um, also shows that as much as 88% of all um, those couples with um, qualifying um, criteria in terms of um, their decision to um, enter into marriage or not, um, the, their um, choice to divorce, excuse me, was based on, again, the outcome of what could, you know, whether they could exit the relationship at any time. So let me just you know sum up this this point with 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 a couple of final impacts that show the economic and cultural um, impact not just from the divorce example but in the light of the theme of this conference in terms of abortion policy. Um, there's a clear link, as we've talked about, um, to single parent headed households in poverty, and some studies suggest that that female headship in particular is so associated with up to eighty percent of all poverty and there's plenty of research that that backs that up. The economic impact on child poverty is not simply what how it impacts those individuals as well it's a burden that society bears um, in total. Um, you know, the, again, extensive research on transfer programs, welfare programs, child help programs that are, you know, between 5 and 10 percent of GDP annually that are um, the result of single parent families. So 
you know, there's extensive economic research that can show both at the federal level but then at the state level, which is what I think is really interesting for this um, theme of this conference because we know in this post row uh, world in which we in environment, state policy and state legislators are going to be much more involved in um, social policy setting as it revolves around abortion law. Um, and so it's, it's important to look at how state level policy, and, and again, in the example of divorce law, has impacted family structure and family breakdown. And so, when, uh, so a couple other uh, points to make in terms of the cultural and moral impact of family breakdown, linking this to the theme of this conference. Um, I'm sure it will come as no surprise to, to folks that abortion, abortion rates have historically been dramatically higher among non-married women. The overwhelming majority of abortions um, on average over the course since 19, um, you know, the early 70 Roe decision, approximately 85% have come from un, unmarried women. Um, that does include uh, some percentage of cohabitating couples. But you know that's a, a massive percentage um, among unmarried women, and the and the impact on uh, marriage from uh, abortion policy is also very interesting. So how does yeah, how did the Roe decision impact um, family structure when it comes came again to the decision um, to be married? So data pre Roe show a clear reduction in marriage rates in states with high abortion ratios. So prior to the, the, the law, state law um, demonstrated that states that were more favorable to abortion had much higher rates of um, uh, or reduction in marriage, again, family breakdown. Also looking at the research on the impact of marriage and divorce, the legalization of abortion and other methods used um, to be able to, uh, you know, not bear a child or produce a child, um, had a much uh, more significant effect on the decision to marry. So there's a strong and dramatic link between abortion and family breakdown when comparing women who used abortion as a birth control method compared to those who would use natural family planning. Um, in a study from um, 2003. Um, of you know, over 10,000 women, Sullen showed that twice as many women who underwent abortion were not married. And he also showed that if they were married, the likelihood of divorce post-abortion was 37% higher. And also, Sullen's also finds that women having abortions are twice as likely never to marry and 37% more likely to divorce on average, so, and, and also have twice as many lifetime sexual partners. So again, the, the, the social policy implications to the breakdown in family are pretty clear when it comes to many examples of social policy making, uh, primarily divorce policy, same-sex marriage policy, and then I think what we're gonna see more and more of is um, policy around abortions, as we've already seen in many states. So let me just um, highlight one more piece that is interesting uh, as an economist from my perspective when it comes to the relationship to the economic outcomes and family breakdown. Um, the economic impact is uh, very interesting when you look at the relationship between family breakdown and economic mobility. So. Uh, the economist Raj Chetty and co-authors, as well as, as additional researchers, um, have examined extensively the causes and correlations related to family and poverty and economic mobility. And it is clear that family and economic mobility are strongly co co excuse me, correlated. When, when I talk about economic mobility, what these researchers looked at is if you are in the bottom, they broke, broke uh, economics down into quartile, or quintile, excuse me, and if you're in the bottom quintile, so the lowest 20% income level, what is the chances, what are the chances that you'll move up to a higher quintile? And Chetty and his researchers 
ex um, uh, did an extensive examination of children born from 1980 to 82, so in those two years, and then he measured their outcomes 30 years later. And the trends, as you might suggest, aren't very positive. Um, the children who grew up more unequal, so those in the bottom quintile, um, had very little chance of climbing up out of that quintile. And interesting, the data show that the problem isn't completely uniform across the United States, so it had some geographic implications. So children growing up in the western portion of the U.S. had a higher per chance of moving up if they were born in the, co in the bottom quintile. And those in the southeast had the least opportunity to move. So wherever you were born, you pretty much stayed your entire life. In short, poor children in western states had a slightly bigger chance to move up. But then it was interesting looking at the top 50 metro areas in the United States and then breaking down the questions of why. So the spatial variation was correlated along five key factors. So how segregated were, were the, those, those people in the, born in the bottom quintile, how segregated they were in terms of where they lived, what was their level of income inequality, how low or how disparate were they, what was their school situation, K through 12 schools. Then they had measure for social capital, so proxies for strength of social networks, were they part of a highly connected family or not. And then lastly, family structure. So that is the fraction of single parent families. And this didn't just impact children at the individual level. These were children of married parents. So who also, the, whether the whole family was in that bottom quintile or somewhere higher. And probably not surprisingly, the last variable, family structure, is the strongest predictor of economic mobility. So I think that's pretty profound implication for our public policy. So what I mean by that is family structure, not race, not job level, not schools, not the churches that they attended, not the neighborhoods that they lived in. Those had some effect, but the strongest effect was family structure. So nothing, nothing matters more for your economic future than who raises you. Or in econ speak, nothing correlates with upward mobility more than the number of single parent, divorcees, and married couples. So the cliche that we, we know intuitively is true, that kids do best in stable, traditional two-parent families and have a much more stable economic future and outlook when they are raised in two-parent families. So let me conclude this by offering some implications of this research, especially in light of the theme of this conference. So examining the role that government plays in shaping marriage and family institutions in the United States and the subsequent economic and cultural consequences is quite revealing. Most importantly, the impact of social and legal policy and decision making significantly impacts the incentives toward marriage and family formation and the choice to keep or abort a child. These policies determine the broad cultural and economic ramifications of family breakdown. And a clear understanding of how these policies have shaped the family also provides necessary insight into the expected implications of future large-scale social policy change, such as the future of marriage and abortion policy at the state level. So for example, it may not be that a change in policy allowing same-sex marriage, for example, will have the same economic impact as divorce policy. We don't know yet, but the cultural ramifications could be even more substantial. The burden of proof as to the neutral impact, so if you know, these policies aren't going to really have much of an impact, but the burden of proof to, of that impact for changing the nature and construction of social policy is clearly on those who desire to reshape policy that will impact the primary social unit, the family, that we have seen defined for millennia in Western civilization. So much of the economic costs of divorce are clear in family breakdown. Um, and divorce laws, we know, have increased divorce rates dramatically. 
And additionally, we know that the overwhelming majority of women who have abortions historically have been unmarried. So these data present um, the, the results to us that these legal and social policies have clear and far-reaching impacts. And it's, uh, I think, incumbent upon uh, progressive government policy under the guise of justice or fairness without concern for these un unintended consequences. Burden and proof is on those policymakers to show um, the social progressive impact that has shaped us for decades, how that's going to be different with subsequent policymaking. So I, I believe policymakers would do well to shift from this myopic view of shaping legislation for the immediate benefit of certain groups um, to what is the long-term cultural impact. And as Hayek reminds us, we're foolish to think that a few individuals have the wisdom to monument monumentally change the culture of a nation for better through legislative decree. So the question obviously can be asked, what should government do to impact marriage, children, and capture the you know, numerous benefits uh, to society of intact families? Um, and as I mentioned a few minutes ago, where traditional marriages flourish, both adults and children are much better off, both economically, culturally, socially. Evidence suggests that where children are raised and born in two-parent families, both the adults and children live longer, have lower rates of mental illness, um, are involved in less crime, domestic abuse, lower rates of suicide. So if the goal of policymakers is to grow the number of intact families where children are raised by two parents, legislatures can enact effective policy to try to meet this objective. Um, again, I don't propose to have all the answers, but I believe in this post-Roe row environment, legislators, legislators should not simply focus on policies that limit abortion, although that's essential. They should also focus on policy that would strengthen marriage. Maybe this can primarily occur through educational reforms. Most of the increase in unwed child rearing is occurring via cohabiting couples. In marriage preparation and education serve uh, um, services, excuse me, at the at the educational level could help move more of these couples toward marriage, and also there's strong evidence um, supporting the disruptive nature of all post-abortion relationships, whether they're cohabiting, common law, or legal marriage, um, but. So, so the point is that research should show that the rapid dissolution of, uh, or research does show the rapid dissolution of post-abortion relationships. And so again, this can, um, I think one of the impacts could be through more uh, significant educational policy around how to, how, to, um, how to help young people understand these profound effects. So it's clear that strong families are the bedrock of Western civilization, and stable married families benefit individuals and communities in numerous ways. And I believe that government should focus on maintaining a cultural consistent with a strong family structure without capitulating to the whims of special interests and those who view policy simply as a matter of contemporary notions of fairness and justice. So I'll pause there and um, take questions. Thank you very much. I was closest to it, so I stole it first. All right, so, so I, I was fascinated by Hayek on knowledge, which Mises talked about as well, and they apply that to things like socialism, right? That there's no way a group of uh, bureaucrats in the Soviet Union could have the knowledge to know prices and production levels. So I, I'm really intrigued to see that, that Hayek applied it to culture as well. And Clark Forsyth earlier this morning talked about Harry Blackman writing the Roe v. Wade decision, and he just didn't have the knowledge at all to know any, and it's so clear in what he wrote, in his opinion. And another example of that, the Obergfell decision was mentioned this morning. Justice Alito, I remember during the oral testimonies in the Obergfell decision, asked the person defending same-sex marriage, he said, 
do you have any idea how children will, will fare in these same-sex couples? He said, this is a, an idea that's not even as old as the cell phone. It, you don't have any knowledge of this. And the, and the person said, well, it's true, Justice Alito. We really don't. We really don't have. But they kind of proceed, you know, headstrong into this move forward without any knowledge of the implications of, of what they're doing. And, and with abortion, Forsyth pointed out all the unintended consequences that they didn't know because they didn't have the knowledge, which they assumed that they had. I don't know. It's a, a comment, but maybe no. a question as well. No, that's, that's a good point. And, and part of my research, I did go down the road of looking at same-sex marriage, marriage policy quite a bit. And that's exactly what came out, is that um, no one really knows, right? We kind of go on, like, it, it feels right, so a lot of people want this. Let's go ahead and do it. But children growing up in these environment... Um, you know that we're just starting to see research showing some of the impacts you know not all favorable by any means um, so the the important point there is not necessarily we don't have a lot of research that shows it's awful for a child in that environment but we have plenty of research that shows that um, the impact on that child is not the same as it is in a traditional two-parent male female family but that's completely ignored and especially if states keep trying to move forward with more uh, you know more policies beyond what the federal government has already done yeah it's very interesting sure yeah hi uh, I just had an observation as well we now have uh, 50 years of data for abortion and its consequences to uh, family and marriage. Uh, so we should be going into this statewide as with our uh, eyes wide open. Sure, yeah. So how do you think we should approach legislatures to uh, take that into account for, uh, economically and culturally? Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's a very good question. I think, um, I mean, even uh, this may sound overly simplistic, but even pointing out that fact that, you know, we have extensive research, research that um, Michael knows he helped me with some of this research, research that shows some of the implications pre row what was going on in certain at the state level that had more, as I mentioned, more lenient policies towards abortion than other states and then we have you know everything that happened nationally post row and to, sh to show that to point out you know study after study that shows the negative impacts not only um, of you know obviously the um, you know we don't know the impact of a child who wasn't born but the impact on those women receiving abortions is just profound and I think just showing that and and um, advocating based on that information is one step because I think as Paul pointed out these legislators they're not even paying attention to data like that they're paying attention to special interests that say we have a right right we have a right to abortion and so you just need to help us make sure our rights are protected those people aren't they're not paying one lick of attention to data and empirical evidence that shows the profound negative effects and so I think we need to be loud about that at the state level yeah Uh, so it's interesting the whole the whole principle of the marriage thing. I guess I got a very simple question: Are we are you would know hopefully because you deal with this nationwide? Is anyone in any of the legislatures listening to any of this and taking any type of action? Do you have any any concrete examples of people saying, "Hey, we need to change our policies on divorce"? Yeah, I mean, I think sadly the answer is no. Um, so that. The, you know, I know, I know, I pay much more attention just because it's my area to the the economic questions. But to that exact point, when I, it was about the first study that Raj Chetty, the economist, and his colleagues did on economic mobility came out. I think it might have been 2015. It was a huge wake up call for certain metro areas, especially because he ranked one through 50, um, and those at the bottom they looked at his data and said you know family structure makes a big difference here you know we have we have outcomes of 
children that are in different neighborhoods, not just all the, the poor area or whatever, that are the same. They're not moving up. They're not becoming better, better off because of their structure, not because of necessarily their race or the schools. And so um, I know certain um, municipal and maybe county uh, governments are, have been starting to look at that a little more. How do, how do we... How do we make any headway into that? But I haven't seen, honestly, much of anything at the state level. I mean, that's, you know, it's one of those things that once you have, you know, 30, 40 years of a policy, turning that ship is almost impossible. But I think, I don't, I don't think there's no hope because I think that at the more local level, there are things that can be done may not impact statewide policy, but it may impact family structure and the support that's needed there to move those people up. Yeah. We have time for one more question. I think there was someone back here. I just don't. Thank you. Um, with the topic of cohabitation, my understanding is that that number is uh, going up and up and up and yeah. up actually pretty quickly. Do you have any data as to the reasons why cohabitation and family structure is in? What are the reasons that people go into cohabitation together, hence also increasing the levels of abortion and those unintended consequences? Yeah. But the question is, why cohabitation numbers are going up. Yeah, unfortunately I don't have a lot of good, I mean there's plenty of people that could stand up here and probably give you some good answers to that. I just haven't done a lot of that research. I do know that um, marriage is definitely being delayed significantly with this generation and part of that, um, you know, cohabitation and delay of marriage are correlated meaning that people are just choosing to kind of wait and it's okay. Um, I know that um, one of our speakers tomorrow, David Ayers, he's done a, a good bit of research of even how people in the church, that those numbers aren't significantly different in certain areas in terms of decision to marry or cohabitate. Um, you know, I've, I've read some uh, research, but not more you know, popular research, I guess. I haven't seen a lot of empirical evidence, but the role of technology and how that's played, how relationships are weaker. So you have weaker ties because we're connected to people, but we don't have deep connections. And so the lack of deep connection leads to both a prolonging of marriage or waiting for marriage and a, you know, maybe we should develop this connection in a cohabitation, cohabiting relationship as opposed to, you know, just waiting for marriage. Um, but there's a, I'm, I know there's a lot of good research on that question and it's, yeah, it's really unfortunate. It really is. Thank you.